very much. So he, who here likes coffee? Excellent, right. So this uh, talk is going to combine a few of my favourite things. Coffee? Python? Mike, Mike, that's not turned on, okay. So it was turned on for the testing before. Is that better? Yeah, okay, right. So this is going to combine some of my favourite things, which is um, coffee, which comes from uh, 20 years of programming. I've got now got a, a coffee addiction. I didn't have one when I started coding. Uh, Python, uh, Linux, and USB analysis. So this is actually two talks for the price of one. The first half of the talk, I'm going to be showing you this um, coffee roaster and uh, Corretto style coffee roaster and explain all about how to build your own coffee roaster uh, and how to then control it using a Python application. Now, in building this coffee roaster, it turns out that I had to do a bit of protocol analysis. And I love protocol analysis. I love working out new devices and writing Linux drivers for them. It's great fun. So I thought that this would be a great opportunity to teach you all a little bit about some simple techniques for protocol analysis of simple USB devices. So the second part of the talk is going to be showing you how to take a, a cheap USB, uh, USB connected multimeter like this and write a Linux driver for it. How to work out the protocol and then write yourself a driver. And it's really very, very simple. It's a very simple techniques. Okay, so let's start off on the actual coffee roasting. So how does coffee roasting work? Well, coffee roasting starts with these things over here. And if I press this fancy little document camera, you might see them beans. There's some green Oh, no, they're not there. There they are. Some green coffee beans. So it starts with these green coffee beans, and then you need to roast them. And there's a few inputs to it. There's the green coffee beans themselves. There is heat. You need to get them very hot. Anyone tell me what, what sort of temperature you need to roast coffee, roughly? To, to, around 210. Yeah, that's right. It's even up on the slides. There you go. Around 210, between 200 and 210, depends on the beans. Right? The optimal temperature, there's lots of discussions uh, on the precise temperature. There's lots of online forums for discussing um, coffee roasting. Uh, the best of them, I think, in Australia is a place called Coffee Snobs. So if you're into coffee roasting, anyone else here a Coffee Snobs member? Yeah, a few? Excellent. Good stuff. So Coffee Snobs is a great place to go for all the information you need on building your own coffee roaster, home um, brewing, etc. Okay, you need some way to stir the beans to distribute the heat. You don't want all the heat going into the top layer of beans. And you need a bit of time. Uh, it typically takes about 15 minutes, um, depending on the, the size of the batch, etc., to switch from having green beans to having roasted beans. So the output is roasted coffee, hot roasted coffee. Uh, you then need to cool the beans as quickly as possible. And this is a part of the whole uh, build your own coffee roaster that I haven't really got into yet, which is building a mechanism for cooling the beans really fast. Because true coffee snobs know that if the beans are cooled faster, they taste better. So currently, I just stir madly in a big colander. And today, I didn't even bring the colander. So they're going to cool pretty slowly. Uh, so I'll give the beans to someone else. <laughs> now, rule of two, some people say rule of three in coffee beans. This is, this is one of the motivations for why people roast their own beans. Green beans, like I've got in this sack of green beans here, last on the shelf about two years, right? And they're still good, okay? Once you've roasted them, they're good for maybe two weeks. I reckon they're best in the first week. After two weeks, they're getting a bit iffy, uh, longer than that, and they're supermarket beans. Right? Uh, once you've ground them, once they're actually in the powder form, they're fresh for about two minutes. At that point, you chuck them out. Right? That's why you don't buy the pre-ground stuff. And that's why all, all the good cafes, they have a grinder there and they grind on the spot. I think that's also why decaf has such a bad reputation in cafes. Because most cafes have the one grinder for their caffeinated beans. Their decaf, if you ask for a, you know, a decaf flat white, they grab out the pre-ground stuff out of the fridge, which has been there for a week, and they give you that, and it's completely stale. You can make really good decaf at home if you roast your own decaf beans. And then you grind your own decaf beans. So what I've got is two grinders, caffeinated grinder, decaf grinder. All right? And that way you can have really good decaf coffee for, for late at night when you actually want to sleep, you know, when you're not coding all night. 
Okay, I don't get through much decaf. Um, <laughs> so, Coretto Roaster. Now, I didn't invent this idea for a coffee roaster like this, not at all. Lots of people have come before me doing this. Um, I've just added a couple of twists on it with the help of um, Paul McCarris and Hugh Blemings, primarily Paulus over there. So, uh, the original idea for this particular style of home coffee roaster, cheap home coffee roaster, was uh, come up with by somebody called Ms. Uh, a person called Ms. Coretto on the Coffee Snob site. And uh, that lady worked out that you, you, if you took a bread machine, a bread machine is designed to take high temperatures and it has a built-in stirrer, right? It stirs the bread, okay, when it's folding the dough, right? So you've got yourself a stirrer and it can take great temperatures. You've got the basis for a coffee roaster. You just need to apply a lot more heat because a bread machine doesn't supply nearly enough heat. So what we need is something like this, a heat gun. Okay, this is a couple of kilowatt heat gun. So point that in at the beans and the beans get really hot, right? Then what we need to do is uh, we need some way of controlling the heat into this roaster. Now the original Coretto was done just by you listen to the roast and you listen for the sounds of the beans as they're cooking. And they go through a stage called first crack we hear this sort of snap, crackle, and pop. And then second crack, right, where it has a slightly different, more subtle pop as the beans get hotter. And you listen to that, and then you adjust the temperature using either adjustable temperature heat gun or moving the heat gun further away or whatever. And I thought, oh, we've got to do better than that. We've got to have computer control over the heat gun, right? And so that's the basis of this thing that Paulus and I have built. Okay, so... Um, what I've done is I've got myself this bread machine. I'll just show you the bits and pieces of it. This is, you know, an ordinary bread machine. I've assured my wife that it could actually be used for bread sometime in the future again, right? Um, maybe. There's a couple of holes in the pan, but hey, we'll, we'll use thick bread that won't leak out too much. Um, so it's got a metal stirrer. I did try and use the plastic stirrer that came with it. Not a good idea at 210 degrees. Discovered that it melted uh, quite badly. Um, this stirrer, I have stuck, a, a drilled it and put a wire through it to stop it flopping over. This is one of those stirrers that flops out of the bread at the end. You don't want it to flop over. Little wire through it, very simple. Couple of holes here, you'll notice. That's where the thermocouple goes in, because if you're going to get your computer to control the roast, you need to know what temperature it's at. So that's what this little thermocouple is for, which pops in that hole there through the side. My original design had the thermocouple sitting inside here, inside the wall of it, and going straight into the pan, what do you think happened? It got too hot, and the plastic all melted, and ended up buying, you know, two or three thermocouples, till I suddenly realised, just drill a hole through the outside of the whole thing, and go right through, and the plastic is then outside the bread machine, it doesn't get as hot, doesn't all melt and fall to pieces. Okay, so, uh, we then need to pour a bunch of green beans, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a demo. Now, I was originally thinking I'd have to run this whole thing at low temperature because I was concerned about the smoke alarms in this room and setting them off and being, you know, hit with a massive fine or whatever. But I have been assured by the good organisers of, of LCA this year that the smoke alarms are turned off. <laughs> so we will... If it starts raining and halon gas comes in or whatever, then it's not my fault. Um, nothing to do with me. So, we've poured a bunch of beans in there. You can, you can fit between sort of five, seven hundred grams roughly, or basically, you know, a bunch of beans. Stick it in there. Um, I'm then going to point this heat gun in at these beans, and I've got my digital multimeter hopefully set to temperature. Some of you should be able to see that there, hopefully. It's saying about 23 degrees C, which is not going to last long. Uh, and then what we're going to do is fire up a little Python script. So I've got this little Python script called PyRoast. And so fire up PyRoast, and notice I'm giving it an argument, P control equals dev TTY USB zero. That's talking to this little device over here. Now this is perhaps the most important part of the whole setup. Uh, and it's really the only unique component that was added on top of the basic design from Coretto. And I didn't build it. Uh, this bit was built by Paulus. So let me just show you, in fact, I'll show you back here what it looks like inside. 
These two little pictures you can see here, this is the Mark I versus Mark II power controller for a home coffee roaster. That's the guts of this one here, which is this little silver box. Coming in on one side is a normal household power 240 volt. Uh, coming out the other is household power 240 volt. Coming in here is a serial port. And in the middle is magic. Uh, <laughs> and the bits of magic in the middle, that's Paulus's um, design. And those bits of magic uh, basically allow me to send some ASCII commands down here. I can either send like 67 and a percent and it means that it just chops the waveform so the 67% of the power gets through, 99%, whatever, I can choose the percentage. Really convenient for uh, a uh, non-hardware geek like myself. I'm very much a software person. It was great. Um, or you can send a number between 0 and 256, um, and it'll similarly produce a, a uh, scaled amount of power coming out there. And so that power then goes into the heat gun, which means that I have this serial port to control the amount of power going into that heat gun, which is great. Uh, now, Paulus' second version of it over here, um, which unfortunately we don't have here today, the second version is a bit fancier. It incorporates the thermocouples, in fact, two thermocouples, directly into the power control device, which means you can read the temperature directly out using the serial connection uh, and because it's got two thermocouples, you can do averaging of the temperature in two parts of the pan, which is much more accurate. You can get a much better result. You'll notice that when I start doing the roast, I get some fluctuations in the temperature. And the primary reason for that is this particular bread maker, which just happened to be the one I had at home, uh, when you set it to the mode that's closest for what you want for roast, which is just continuous stir, it reverses direction every two minutes. And that means the beans that were cold get shoved over a different part of the pan, the other one's hot, etc., and you end up getting a bit of fluctuation in the power. Okay, so let's try and fire it up. So let's see, if we fire up this little coffee roaster, then what we're seeing here, hopefully you can, you can see that, um, you see the temperature there showing 23.2 degrees C. It shows the rate of change there, 0, 0.0 degrees C per minute, the elapsed time, and you've got buttons down here for choosing when you hit first crack, so you listen for it, because then you keep all your roast profiles and you exchange them with your friends on coffee snobs. That's the idea. <laughs> um, and you say, this one tasted really good. You can also load a, a previous profile and use that as the target temperature profile for the Python controller, which has a, a bit of a modified PID loop. Can anyone tell me why, a, you, you know, all know what a PID loop is, don't you? Right, you know, roughly control loop, basic computer science control loop. Why isn't the basic PID loop exactly what we want to control the heat going into this? Anyone guess why? Lag. Exactly. Hand up there. Excellent. That's the lag. There's in fact a huge amount of lag. If you up the heat here, then the actual temperature won't start rising considerably for about 15 to 20 seconds. It takes quite a while for the heat to penetrate through the bean mass. And so the solution I came up to, because I haven't actually done any control theory and things, I just thought, I'll put a PID loop at the end of a bucket brigade, right? So I just created like a little cascading one-dimensional bucket brigade where it simulates heat transfer from bucket to bucket to bucket to bucket done on half-second averaging between the buckets. And at the end of it, there's a PID loop controlling with a delay, and that produces a basic model of the heat propagation, a one-dimensional model of heat propagation through the beans and that worked pretty nicely. Um, and in fact, the whole thing can run in simulation mode where it simulates the actual, the full roast, allowing you to tune the PID loop by matching the simulation to real roasts, um, which then allows you offline to sort of experiment without ruining quite as many, you know, wonderful beans. Okay, so what we're seeing there is a little graph there. You can see the little pink line very faintly in the bottom left corner. The temperature has been sitting right at about 23.2 degrees. And what we're going to do is we're going to temporarily turn off auto power control and set a target temperature. Now, as I've been assured that the smoke detector's off, I'm going to set it at 210, which is what I would normally do for these sort of beans. These particular beans, by the way, are Bolivia Green Mountain Estate uh, beans. Oh, another reason why a lot of people get into home roasting initially, or the excuse they give to their wives, is that coffee's much cheaper as green beans, typically about nine bucks a kilo. 
Um, so you can drink a lot more coffee for the same amount. Um, but that's really just an excuse, because then you, you know, spend it all on the other bits and pieces. But <laughs> whatever. Okay, so I'm going to fire this thing up and then put it on auto power control. And I'll also clear that graph, so just reset the graph. So what you'll see now is that this little, um, it's getting quite warm here. If any of you want to come down, by the way, and you know, um, oh, I need to actually turn on the stirring or it's going to get really bad. Right, so I've now put it, started to stir the beans. Okay, got to make sure I have the stirring. I would have burnt the beans quite badly if I'd left it on too long. So the temperature, you should see it starting to rise there. My apologies for the small size of the graph. Everyone still see it okay? Yeah? If you can't, come down the front and have a, have a peek. Um, so the temperature start, will start rising and um, it'll take about 15 minutes for a full roast. Um, I may not do the full roast today because we're going to probably run out of a bit of time. I want to get into the USB protocol analysis. But um, it's very simple and um, well, we, maybe we could take it to first crack and see if you can hear the, the beans popping for first crack. Okay, getting quite warm. This little tile here, by the way, is just to try to keep more of the heat inside the pan. Um, you just need a heat-proof tile covering part of it. And the exact orientation of the heat gun and things probably matters. Uh, just reverse. After two minutes, it reversed direction. So you'll see a bit of a fluctuation in the temperature graph there. Okay, so that's our, that's our basic roaster. Um, now, maybe I should show you, if, shall I leave that running? Can you actually hear me give the talk while I talk the rest of the stuff and leave it roasting? You're all happy with that? Okay, so then I'll go back and talk a bit more about some of the other things that... Uh, right, so that's a power control device. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about next is um, one of the interesting things that I think... Uh, that, I, that I needed to work out for this particular task. So I had this USB multimeter and um, Paulus's solution of course was just to build a thermocouple himself directly in his power control device so he didn't need to work out the protocol to talk to his own device because he was able to convince himself to give himself the protocol. And whereas in my case I got this you know, cheap Victor Chinese um, digital multimeter so I need to work out what the protocol is. Now what's happening is this multimeter, it's got a little button on it, it's marked RS232, right? It was originally a serial multimeter in design, and then the manufacturers then converted it to be a USB multimeter, put this little bit in the top, it gives me a USB cable. But there is no documentation on the uh, protocol this thing talks from the multimeter across to the computer. So you need to work that out. Now, how would you normally work that out. I mean, this, this technique I've got up on the screen is the usual technique that, that most people use. Um, what they do is they think, okay, I've got a Windows driver for this thing because you get, if you go to the website of the manufacturer of this multimeter, you'll find that there is, in fact, a device driver for Windows which will display whatever's on the multimeter up on the Windows box, right? And then there's lots of software out there for capturing USB packets. For example, Wireshark can do it. How many of you have used Wireshark for USB sniffing? For USB sniffing? A few? Yeah, everyone's used Wireshark. I knew that. <laughs> so Wireshark, it turns out, actually supports USB sniffing. Um, the kernel has the ability to capture data using debugfs. Um, so you just, there's a instructions in the kernel documentation. Grep for debugfs and USB, you should find it and uh, tells you how to mount the debugfs file system and then you end up with some text files, you can just cat them and those contain the raw USB data. And that's great, except there's a, there's a slight problem with this technique. Who can tell me what the difficulty with the technique of just capturing all the data going between the Windows driver and the uh, device is? What would you do? Okay, how would you go about it? Say you could just capture all the data. What would you do with that data to then write a driver? Sorry? You want to know what it's saying. That's right. You don't want to know what that data meant. Now, it's fluctuating all the time. The temperature's jumping up and down, right? At any particular point in time, you don't know. It's hard to capture the precise timing and what it's displaying. Plus, you can't test theories with this method. 
right? You either write the right device driver or you don't. But what you really want a way to do is to feed arbitrary data to the Windows device driver. Let's see how this roast is going, by the way. Let's pop back here. So we're up to about 120 degrees C now. So it's getting a bit warmer. Can you smell the coffee? Yeah, yeah excellent. Now notice the other thing you get here. Chaff. Right? Now, I didn't actually warn the organizers about this, but um, it's a bonus, right? You get a lot of this chaff, and normally what you do is you have a great big fan, room fan, blowing it out over the audience. Uh, but uh, all I'm going to do is get it in among the, uh, my laptop instead. So I've got a great big pile of chaff in my garage now where it builds up. The chaff is the, the husk of the coffee bean, and as it gets roasted, the chaff starts coming off. You get a lot of it and <laughs> um, it builds up in your garage, but you just sort of you know, vacuum it up or whatever or sweep it out. Um, uh, anyway, the, the other problem is without a fan to blow the chaff out, we are probably going to get some, a little bit of ignition of some of the chaff in the heat gun. Um, but it'll only, it'll only last very briefly. You'll get to see an occasional spark here as it gets up to higher temperatures with the chaff running into the temperature, because the actual heat gun itself it's um, six or seven hundred degrees. It's quite hot, and it's quite happily uh, will burn the chaff. I haven't burnt down any uh, lecture theatres yet, um, although this is the first attempt. <laughs> right. So 143 degrees C so far, and we haven't got anywhere near first crack. So we'll go back to what I was discussing a minute ago: USB protocol analysis. Okay, interleaving the two talks here. Um, bit of a balancing act. So what you really want to do? is find a technique for being able to modify the data as it goes between the USB device, the multimeter in that case, and a Windows device driver. Right? So the technique that I recommend is this basic arrangement. So you've got yourself your Windows driver um, displaying what's on the display on the USB connection, and you've got yourself a packet rewriting filter of some sort, a program. In my case, Emacs. Um, so, you know, universal programming tool is Emacs. So you want Emacs to be sitting between, smoke's getting a bit more now, uh, between the Windows driver and your USB device, then you have the USB device. So how do you actually arrange for this? And the particular technique that I use for this project is the following. All right? So what you have is VirtualBox 4, which, by the way, um, one of the good things came out of the whole Oracle Sun thing is Oracle released VirtualBox under the GPL. Excellent. Uh, so it's, I'm running the GPL um, base release. There's proprietary add-ons, but the base version is full GPL, which is great. So VirtualBox for um, the Windows display, a little driver that displays what's on the multimeter. Then it goes into an LD preload. I love LD preload. Um, I, I'm sure that um, Ulrich hates my guts as a result of it. He's always trying to kill off LD preload type hacks. Uh, anyway, LD preload is a wonderful hack. You can preload into VirtualBox. Now, of course, I've got the source code to VirtualBox. I could just hack VirtualBox. It's much easier to write a preload. Um, if you line preload, it would take me oh, hours to work out where the USB code is inside VirtualBox and hack it. Much easier to write a little preload, much more fun. So write an LD preload, and the idea is to, the LD preload writes all the data that it gets from the real device, the USB device, to a log file. Right? So you get the raw data going into a log file, preferably nicely formatted for human use. You want it in a nice hex dump type format, one line per packet sort of thing, uh, coming down into a log file, really easy to use. Then what you want is your LD preload needs to also take input. And so what I've got is a control file, and that control file, if the control file is there, then the LD preload, when the control file data size matches the packet, it will replace the data packet on the way through with whatever's in that file. Okay, so it'll read the control file and replace the data on the way through. That means you can just have Emacs open on that control file edit the hex bytes, right? And whenever you hit save, the Windows driver starts seeing different data. Okay, which that means you can experiment. You can very, very quickly say, oh, we could, it's sudden temperature. Let's watch this, hang on, back to the other talk. Um, 172 degrees C getting up there. And notice the fluctuation, the two minute oscillations. 
Um, that's what's solved by Paulus' second device with two thermocouples. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it, with the two thermocouples, you can, you can average between the two, and Pyrost, of course, supports that. Yeah, Paulus? Probably take what? I, I get too much smoke. Oh, they have a smoky, do they? Oh, there you go. Okay. So um, I will remove the tile at this point, hoping not to burn myself. All right. Oh, one hot tile. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So the beans will get less smoky that way. Okay. Good. So um, that roast will take a little bit longer. Right. So what? That hasn't quite reached first crack yet. Okay, so we got the control file, then you got Emacs, the USB device, and that's the basic technique. And the thing I'd really like to emphasize when you're trying to work out a new protocol, spend some time to get your work environment set up to have a quick development cycle. You, don't, you want to be able to try and experiment with uh, testing a theory of how the protocol works in seconds. You say, oh, I wonder if the, you know, the seventh byte the high nibble of that is that segment of the display. Test, test, done. You know the answer. Because that fast development cycle makes all the difference. <coughs> I've seen too many people using a technique where they have to reboot the Windows box each time they want to try a, a new experiment. Right? No good. You get a really fast development cycle because it does take a lot of thought to work out a new protocol. Particularly one as bizarre as this one. It's really quite bizarre. Okay. So, how are we doing now on the, must be getting close to temperature, 181 degrees C, getting up there. Now for the next part of the talk, we're actually going to work out the protocol for this multimeter. The problem is that I need the multimeter disconnected from the coffee roaster to do that. Um, so, um, I might just wait, let this roast go a little bit longer and then we might actually stop the roast because otherwise I'm going to run out of time in the USB protocol analysis part of the talk. It means these beans won't be so good uh, because we're stopping it way too early. But uh, I think that's probably the best thing to do. So I'm going to stop this roast at this point and uh, turn off auto power, force the power down to zero. I'll save that roast and, right, let's stop this thing. <laughs> Okay, right. But you get the idea. The problem is we would have run out of time, I think, and I'd really like to move on. That was deafening. Um, like to move on to the second part of the talk, which is let's actually do some protocol analysis. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and put this, um, this display, we don't need that power control device, going to try and put this multimeter on the this display over here so that you can actually see what's going on with it and let's see so you sort of know what what this thing does that's a bit zoomed in how do I zoom out uh, zoom out no other way more more no, it just sort of it only zooms a tiny bit at a time keep pressing all right Okay, so that's my multimeter, right? And there's a little thermocouple sitting there, okay? So what it's doing is it's displaying 50 degrees C at the moment. Now, um, this um, test, oh, bug in that, that program, isn't that terrible? Imagine a coffee roasting application with a bug. Um, <laughs> <wouldn't>... <laughs> All right, okay. So what I'm going to do now is flick across to this... Um, application, I'm going to bring up a, this is a Windows virtual machine. I'll just flick it back to the laptop display for a moment. Okay. Now, that's fine. Yeah, it doesn't like the mouse. So here we got um, Windows 7, and this is Windows 7 running the digital multimeter application that came with the, um, uh, that you can get download from the website. Okay, so what I'm going to do is in VirtualBox, you can tell it to, uh, well, supposedly, if this thing actually, this might, it won't take mouse clicks, so let's see whether it'll take it from here. No, I can't click the mouse on this menus and things at the moment. Maybe I can do it up via this. It's not seeing any USB devices whatsoever. 
Well, there you go. Uh, demos. Uh, LSUSB doesn't hang. Let's unplug it and plug it back in again, which is the usual technique. All right, and see if. Yeah. Any kernel developers in the house? Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. Come on, USB. You can do it. There you go. Now let's see if this thing has recognized that it's got... Nope. So what we're going to do is we're going to reset um, the virtual machine. And it's failed to save state. And let's try and just power it off. And let's see if we have any luck. So we may not be getting an awful lot of lu luck here. So I'll show you the little script I use. Um, uh, let's see. Junk code, preload, USB, start win 7, and LD preload. Let's get to the right. There it is. OK, that's the command I'm running there. I'll just up the font a little bit here. So is that just about readable? Yeah, LD preload equals full path to my preload.usb.so, uh, and then I'm directly running the VirtualBox application. Now, I'm running this as root. The reason is that um, preload and non-root applications, when they start switching um, UID while they're running, doesn't work. So you need to actually start up your virtual machine as root. So this is, in this case, running it as root. It's the easiest way. You can instead is, um, put the whole thing in etc. the ld.so.preload. Uh, everyone know what an LD preload is? Anyone not know LD preload? Okay, a few people. Right, LD preload is a hack. Um, <laughs> you basically create a shared library. You create it, say you've got a function that you want to replace in an application, VirtualBox. So VirtualBox, um, I've actually got a slide about this, would you believe? Um, VirtualBox controls the USB devices by opening the device with an open call. In fact, it uses Open64. Um, then it calls IOCTLs, IO control functions. And it has two, two main IO controls it uses. One is called USB DevFS Submit ERB, and the other is UFS DevFS Reap ERB End Delay. They're the two primary ones. You can guess what it does. The end delay means don't, don't wait, right? Um, so Submit ERB takes some data and squirts it at the device. Then Reaperb um, returns the reply from that data packet back to the application, okay, and it tells you what pointer. It gives you back your original pointer to the structure, this USB um, ERB structure. Gives you back that pointer so you got the original uh, structure back with filled in data replied from the device. So what you can do with an LD preload is create a little shared library that implements your replacement functions for open and um, IOCTL and close. And when you see an open and the path to the open is the USB device uh, that you want to intercept, then you remember what file descriptor. You do the real open, right? Because you can ask the C library for a pointer to the real open. Then what you do is you get that real one and you um, remember it. Then when you get an IOCTL, if that IOCTL is on that file descriptor you got earlier, then you, you've got an operation on that device, in which case you can read the data that's going out to it and you can see the data that came back and you can start replacing the data before you return to the application. So that's what you do with LD preloads. Very simple technique, really. It's not much code. Um, so if I start this, I hope that VirtualBox will start and not crash on me. I've had various problems with my USB. Oh, it's going to boot, reboot Windows. How about that? I'm booting Windows in an LCA talk. <laughs> OK. So once this thing starts up, then um, I will be able to give it the USB device, patch that into this Windows virtual machine, and... Hopefully that will work. There you go. So there's all my USB devices, and I'm going to patch in the Shenzhen Victor high-tech multimeter, which is now patched into that Windows virtual machine like that. So if I now um, run this DMM app and tell it to go start, yes, 20.7. That's the correct temperature off here. So it's now currently reading this multimeter. My LD preload is passing the data through to the Windows device driver, and it's doing one additional thing. It's, as I said, 
men mentioned before, it logs everything. Right? So if I do tail minus f slash chimp slash USB dot log, you'll see all the data there flowing between the multimeter and the Windows device driver. Okay, so now, as an audience, we will now work out the protocol for this device. Right, so let's first of all, what we're going to do is chimp USB dot log, open it up, there's our log. Okay, now we want to know, we first of all got to get some examples of what the bytes might mean. So what we need to do is take one of these rows and put it into this USB.data and now what happens is my log is now saying that it's replacing this data with that fixed line. Right? And so now I can read off what is on the Windows display which is, I'll just make this window a bit smaller so you can see it, 20.8. So we can now put a comment on that, 20.8C, in fact it's 020.8C. So we now know that those bytes are 20.8 degrees C. Now we need some different bytes. Okay, what do you do? Well, you stick this in your mouth. <laughs> okay? And this is the version from, you know, having the data in my mouth. And we see that that temperature, if I now put that as the top line, my preload just takes the first line, it now reads 27.7 degrees C. So that line is uh, 27.7 C, 027 Right? Now what we ideally want is an example, examples with only one digit different. So we can start, we want really minimal differences in data and then we try to work out which bytes, okay, are correspond with what digits on the multimeter. So here's a couple of examples that I just grabbed earlier from sticking into my mouth less aggressively. And so this one here is 24.2 degrees centigrade, read by Windows. And Windows is interpreting those 14 bytes as 24.2, whereas if I put this one, it's 24.1 degrees C. So all of you now have a good stare and tell me which bytes are different between those two. The first byte is different, and the third byte is different. Is anything else different? No, just the first byte and the third byte. Okay, now, now we start seeing can we construct a temperature, right? So we think that that last digit, the one and the two, is either the, is the first byte and the third byte. And notice that the second nibble of those two bytes hasn't changed. Only the top nibble, top four bits, has actually changed. That could matter, right? You've got to notice these things. Okay, so let's see whether we construct 20. Let's see if we can make... 20.2. So let's take that 20.8 and try to make this 20.2. What we need to do is take this 1B there and take that 3D there, 20.2. There you go. We've now constructed a new temperature and we've fed it to the multimeter and it's displayed it. Okay? So that means we are now in a, in a um, process where we can start sending bytes to the Windows display testing our theories. And we take, we take our notepad or our Emacs buffer and take a note that the first and third byte appears to be that fourth digit. Right? And so you keep doing that. You know, you, you find another digit that's different. You write little one-line orc things. We take your USB data log and you see what possible patterns were there in my log. If I do something like, uh, let's say, cat USB data log grep uh, minus V equals and orc uh, print dollar uh, one space dollar um, three um, like something like that and sort minus u right that's all the bytes that's all the variants of byte one and three that we've got now how many are there one two three well wc minus l you know why be why count when you can get a computer to do it twelve examples there's twelve different things we've we've had in that that digit okay now. That's, that's quite plausible because there's 10 digits and there's also cases where there's a dot there, you know, it's quite plausible at 12 possible digits. We could start shoving in some of these, so let's take one of them, BB4D, okay, and throw that into our example data. So BB4D and that's, ah, now that's interesting, right? What we've done no, this is no longer scrolling. This is no longer updating its temperature graph. What's happened? Invalid input data. 
Now, this, this is where things get interesting because a lot of Windows drivers will just keep displaying. Some of them will just stop, but it's, and some of them will log an error. It's great if they log an error and tell you what's wrong. Um, but the most common thing is they just don't display something when they get invalid input. So that tells you that that combination of bytes isn't valid, and that's interesting data, right? Okay, now, because I'm running a bit low on time, what I'm going to do now is show you the second stage of this when you're doing analysis. So this, this is the basic stages. First stage, start with existing data blobs, edit and watch the results on a Windows display, try to work out the patterns. Done. Excellent. Theory testing. Write a tool to produce what you think is the desired data and test your tool. Well, that's easy, right? So what I've got here is a little tool called set LCD and it's just a tiny little C program and what it does is it takes a, what I think and it sends it, puts it, writes it to that file which the preload reads and displays and Windows says yeah I got it right, 1234C or once you've looked a bit further you realize how to put decimal points in you get 1.234C or 1.2.34C <laughs> One point two point three point four C, etc. Um, so, and you play a bit further, and you work out how to do, you know, change it display amps. And I've started giving it amps. It'll actually get unhappy about some of that because it'll change. It doesn't like changing mode. So I'll put it back to degree C. You can work out all the different display modes because this thing can flick around between different display modes, right? Hertz, voltage, amps, microamps. Use the same technique. You can work out the entire thing. Right, so after that, of course, you now know exactly what the protocol is. Now all you do is you detach your little um, USB here, wait for VirtualBox to be happy about the fact you've pulled the USB cable out while it's reading from it. A few more seconds, and then you can write yourself your own reader, and you end up with something like this, which... Is now, it's, sometimes it has to reset the multimeter a couple of times. Let me just try it again. Come on. No, pull it out and try again. Occasionally the multimeter just gets stuck and stops sending data. All right, so I'll see whether I can kill this and start it again. Hopefully it comes up. Still waiting for it to come up. There you go. Okay, that's now reading the same temperature off here, and we've got ourselves a Linux device driver. All right? <laughs> And I can flick it to DC microamps, or I can flick it to amps, or to hertz, or all the different range settings, and it's like, you know, 100 lines of Python, and it works. So you've got yourself then, uh, you can do graphing and all the rest. So that's basically the technique for working out the protocol for a simple USB device like this. This particular one is output only. You have no inputs, makes it particularly easy. If you need input and output, you may need something a little more advanced than Emacs on a text buffer, um, but that's fine. The basic mechanism that I'm suggesting you use is set up your tools, your protocol analysis tools, so when you're testing a theory, it's quick. Okay, so that's it for coffee roasting, and any questions? Um, if you're just doing hot air roasting, why not use a uh, popcorn maker? Okay, popcorn maker is a very popular um, uh, type of home coffee roaster. One problem with popcorn makers is they take very small batches of beans, typically a couple of hundred uh, grams of beans. Um, second problem is they, uh, lots of people on coffee snobs reckon you don't get quite the depth of flavour with a, um, a popcorn maker, but it just, I've never tried it, maybe it's better flavour, I don't know. Um, the larger mass of beans and the more even temperature you end up with this supposedly ends up with slightly better roast. Um, plus I already, I didn't have a popcorn maker, I did have a bread maker. <laughs> yep. Um, with VirtualBox, my understanding is that it doesn't have USB pass-through in the GPL, so I'm assuming... It does. The, the GPL version has this USB pass-through? I'm running, the, this is pure GPL, except so for the actual using, Windows image. So you're not actually using the binary extension thing? No. I'm using the, the, okay. the VirtualBox version 4 has USB 1, 1.1 or whatever, pass-through yeah, okay. built in in the GPL version. It doesn't have USB 2, 2 pass-through. Yes. So yeah. if you're doing video capture devices, 
you either have to use the proprietary add-on Yep. Or you'll have to use a different technique. Yes. Um, yep. But most of the stuff I play with is over USB 1. And lots of stuff does work to some extent over USB 1. Um, I've even managed to do a video device and actually get it to play a simple bit of video, a TV capture card. Mm -hmm. I managed to do that successfully. It, you can do some stuff, quite a bit of stuff over USB 1, as long as you're willing to put up with lousy frame rates and missed images and that sort of thing occasionally, which is fine for protocol analysis. Yeah, and if you've got a device that actually needs USB 2 for whatever reason, then you do have to use those... You have to use the proprietary add-on. And the great the thing is yeah. the LD preload will work with the proprietary yes. add-on. Fine. Yeah. Um, and because you're not actually requiring the source code, I didn't have to actually hack VirtualBox for any of the stuff I'm doing. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but, yep. No worries. Right. So who's going to build their own coffee roaster now? A few people? Go for it. Yeah. So join the Coffee Snob site. You can end up with a little Coffee Snobs membership card, which also doubles as a... Uh, so if somewhere here I've got my Coffee Snobs membership. There it is. And it comes with a little guide to roasting. Uh, showing the different uh, colour. So right now that is, um, don't drink this. Uh, <laughs> because it hasn't been roasted nearly enough. But uh, you get this little membership card like that and that doubles as your um, guide for roasting. And you get people discussing like a, a CS9 roast. I'll put it on the document camera. Ring now, don't send anybody. <laughs> okay, everyone, we're sort of out of time. Yep. So. Um, just like to say thank you, Trich. This is Great. a small gift from Linux Australia. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you for a fantastic conference.